Hallelujah. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? I said, are you glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Church, can we just stand up and honor God for Bishop tonight? The pastor, the shepherd of this house. Bishop Johnson, we honor you. We honor our mother, Pastor Chris, tonight. We bless God for you. Can you just lift your hands all over this place tonight? Just forget about who's around you just for a moment. And let's just invite the presence of the Lord in this place tonight, just for a moment. Just tell the Lord you are worthy. Jesus, we honor you tonight. We give you praise tonight, Lord. 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 You are worthy of worship, worthy of honor, worthy of adoration. We honor you tonight, Lord. Come on, the presence of the Lord is in this place tonight. Father, your glory fills the temple. Your train fills the temple. There is no God like you, Lord. There is no one like you. You are worthy of praise. Come on, church, open your mouth just for one minute. Tell the Lord tonight he's worthy. You are worthy, Jesus. There's no one like you, Lord. You are worthy, Lord. God, we exalt you. We glorify your name. We glorify your name, Lord. Jesus, we lift you up. We lift you up. We lift you higher. no one like you Lord you deserve all the glory Yahweh Yahweh and you deserve all the glory Yahweh Yahweh come on just tell the Lord you deserve all the glory Yahweh, Yahweh, you deserve, you deserve all the glory. Yahweh, Yahweh, come on, just tell the Lord you deserve, you deserve all the glory. Sing Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. Yahweh, you deserve, you deserve all the glory. And Yahweh, Yahweh. Holy Spirit, we just ask you to have your way tonight, Lord. Spirit of the living God, we rely upon you. You are our teacher. You are our shepherd. And we look to you. Father, your presence is all over this place, Lord. Let your glory manifest itself tonight. Be thou glorified, Lord. Be thou glorified, Lord. Father, tonight we pray, open the heavens, Lord. Let the floodgates of heaven be open, Lord. We've come with expectation, Lord God. We've come with expectation tonight, Father. Let your glory fill this place, Lord. Show yourself strong, Lord. Show yourself strong, Lord. We give you all the praise, Lord. We give you all the glory. Come on, one more time. Can we just shout a hallelujah tonight? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Hallelujah. Again, we're so grateful tonight for the opportunity to share the word of the Lord with you. We have come all the way from Hagerstown, Maryland, and it is such a, an honor and a privilege to be standing before you tonight. As Bishop was saying, um, Bethel has been my home church. I was fortunate to grow up in this ministry and the impact that this ministry has had on my life. And I'm so grateful because of the teaching that is here from the youth ministry with Pastor Peabody and Pastor Mama to the prayer ministry and there's just so many wonderful things that God has done in this ministry and that has really impacted my life and I'm so grateful to be serving Jesus today and I know that would not be the case had it not been for the seeds that was planted in me in this ministry. So can we just celebrate 
Bethel World Outreach, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. If you have your Bibles tonight, if you can turn with me to the book of Luke, and tonight we want to minister out of a very familiar passage that many of you are familiar with, and we want to draw some things from out of this passage in Luke chapter 22, from verses 54 to 62. Luke chapter 22, verses 54 to 62. And tonight I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. Luke chapter 22, verses 54 to 62. And the scripture declares, so they arrested him and led him to the high priest's home. And Peter followed at a distance. The guards lit a fire in the middle of the courtyard and sat around it, and Peter joined them there. And a servant girl noticed him in the firelight and began staring at him. Finally, she said, this man was one of Jesus' followers, but Peter denied it. Woman, he said, I don't even know him. And after a while, someone else looked at him and said, you must be one of them. And he said, no, I'm not. And about an hour later, someone else insisted this, this must be one of them because he is a Galilean. But Peter said, I do not know what you're talking about. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. And at that moment, the Lord turned and looked at Peter. And suddenly the Lord's words flashed through Peter's mind. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny three times that you even know me. And verse 62, the scripture says, and Peter left the courtyard weeping bitterly. Tonight, I want to deal with the subject that many of us, we have faced at some point in our lives and if we haven't faced it, we are going to face it at some point and that subject is dealing with and overcoming regret. Can you say that word with me, regret? When the scripture talks about regret, the Bible is making reference to sorrow or some type of remorse over something that has taken place or over something that we've done. So when we talk about regret, we're talking about expressing some type of sorrow or some type of remorse over something that has taken place or over something that we've done. When we experience regret, what it does is that it, it brings an uneasiness to our minds. When we are focusing on the would ofs and the could ofs and the should ofs. And at times when we are looking at certain events that have taken place in our lives and we start to ponder if we had done this, maybe the outcome would have been this. If we had made this decision, if we hadn't had got involved with this. And sometimes we may find ourselves wondering and thinking about those things. And the effect of that is that it creates an uneasiness within our mind because we start regretting, we start remorsing. Why did I do that? Why did I choose to go here? If I had another opportunity, I would have done it this way. And the reality The reality of it is that when we are talking about life, there are, in some cases, no do-overs. The reality of it is that most of us, if we're honest, most of us would love the opportunity to be able to go back in time and to undo some things. If you believe that, can I get an amen tonight? But the reality of it is that that is not the case. The reality of it is that for many of us, the decisions that we make in life, whether good or bad, that we have to bear those consequences. Tonight, when we look at the life of Peter, we are looking at someone who was part of Jesus' inner circle. 
Jesus, when he made reference to Peter, he told Peter that he would use him to build his church upon Christ's identity. At the Last Supper, it was Peter who Jesus sent to prepare the communion. So we see even when Jesus would separate himself to go and pray, oftentimes he would take Peter and James and John along with him. And amongst the believers, Jesus' disciples, Peter was the boldest. When the disciples saw Jesus walking on the water, it was Peter who said, Lord, if it's you, command me to come out of this boat and to come towards you. And so Peter was not just somebody that was, that was normal. No, Peter in Jesus' circle was someone with very high rank. But here's why this is important. Because as great as Peter was, as influential as Peter was, what we are fortunate to witness in the life of Peter is a man with great influence, a man with great power, but also a man who suffered some type of regret in his life. At the most critical time before Jesus was going to be betrayed, Jesus sitting at a communion table with his disciples, he tells them, one of you among me is going to betray me. And you can imagine all of the disciples, they looked at one another, wondering who it was. And Jesus said it is the one who dips his hand. Now we know that he was referencing to Judas. But it was Peter, the scripture tells us, who said, Lord, it's not me. I will die with you. I will go to prison for you. And Jesus said, Peter, you don't know what you're saying. By this time tonight, you would have denied me three times. And Peter said, Lord, no, I would never. I would die with you, Jesus. I would go to prison with you, Jesus. But Jesus knew that there was something that was going to take place in Peter's life that had the power to shift his life if he allowed it. You see, many of us are like Peter today, beloved. Where every day we are faced with challenges and circumstances that no one sees. Besides you and God. And the reality that we face overcoming and dealing with the temptations of the world when no one is around. Whether choosing to give in to the lust of the flesh or give in to sin or choosing to say no and to trust in the saving grace of Christ. The reality of it is that every single day you and I are faced with situations and circumstances that have the power to shift our life for the good or the power to alter our lives and take us off course. Now some situations you and I cannot control. But the ones that we can, it is critical that in those moments, when they come, that we are able to rely upon the Holy Spirit to guide us. That when those moments come, we are able to recognize when this is a situation that God wants to get the glory out of and when it's not. Peter was an influential man. But yet he was a man that would one day deal with regret. The scripture is full of men and women who have dealt with this issue of regret, of some type of remorse. In 1 Samuel chapter 24, verse 5, the Bible talks about David who had regretted cutting the hem of Saul. In Jeremiah chapter 15, verse 10, we see the prophet Jeremiah where he begins to cry out because he regrets his birth, because of the burden he has to carry. He was tired of quarreling. He was tired of being cursed by people. 
In Matthew chapter 27, verse 3, we even see the story of Judas who betrayed Jesus and after realizing what he did, tried to return the money, 30 pieces of silver. And we see there an expression of remorse because he realized what he had done. Even in Genesis chapter 6, verses 7, the Bible says where God regretted making man, that regretted there, that, that Hebrew understanding, uh, that, that word there is meaning he sighed. He sighed. He was sad because man was constantly wicked and it grieved God. And so we see even in the scriptures, Men and women have dealt with this issue of regret. But the reality of it, beloved, if you and I are going to deal with and overcome this issue of regret, there are things that we must know and there are things that we must apply when those situations come up that can shift our life for the good or shift our life for the bad. Hear me. The first thing you need to know is this when we're talking about overcoming and dealing with regret is Jesus died so that you and I would not live with regret. If we're going to overcome regret and, and dealing with regret, the first thing we have to understand is that Jesus died so that you and I would not deal with the issue of regret. When we look at the scripture, the Bible tells us, Jesus, that he took on our sins upon himself. In other words, he took our regrets upon himself on the cross. He took our guilt. He took our shame. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. You'll see what the apostle Paul says here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verses 21, and the Bible declares, Paul says that, for he made him, meaning Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Christ became the very became sin for you and I. He took our regrets. He took our shame. He took our guilt upon himself. He suffered the full penalty of God's wrath in our place so that you and I would not have to deal with these issues. And in this case, specifically the issue of regret. When we look at the life of Peter, what Peter did not understand, beloved, was that the very issue that he was weeping over when he denied Jesus, the very issue that, that he had regret about, Jesus was going to the cross to die for. Peter did not understand that that burden that he was carrying, being as close as he was to Jesus, having the kind of stature that he did, Peter did not understand, beloved, that the guilt, the shame, that regret that he was carrying, that Jesus was going to the cross to deal with that. You see, there are times, beloved, where we worry about things that are out of our control. There are times where we, we pay too much attention to unnecessary things that don't add to our lives, but they only take away. Jesus told his disciples, don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow has its own issues. Live day by day. Ask God for your daily bread, your daily needs. Hear me, beloved. Because of what Jesus has done on the cross, through his death, through his resurrection, what it means for you and I is that Christ has freed us from carrying unnecessary weights. The scripture tells us, let us lay aside every weight or sin 
And the Lord knows that there are times, beloved, just like Peter, where we may find ourselves having made some bad decisions, having gone against what we know the word of God says, and living in regret. But in those moments, we must remind ourselves that Jesus died for this issue that I have. That Jesus dealt with it on the cross. Hallelujah. In Christ Jesus, there are no regrets. Can you say that with me? In Christ, there are no regrets. In other words, God's will is perfect. The scripture tells us that the steps of the righteous man are ordered, but it does not define the kind of steps that the man takes. The emphasis that it puts on is not the man who is stepping, but rather the God who is ordering his steps. In Christ, there are no mistakes. God's will for your life is perfect. God's will for this church is perfect. And I know, beloved, that there are times where we wonder... If only I can do that over. We have to move past that because we have to understand that the will of God is perfect. That God is ordering my steps whether I like it or not. It's not a matter of if he's going to do it. It's a matter of me believing and accepting that he is. The path has already been drawn out for you and I. But it is our responsibility whether we are going to walk that path and trust Christ and allow him through the steps he's already ordered to lead us, to guide us. Remember what Jesus says in John 10, that my sheep, they know my voice. Jesus' ability to lead his sheep it's something that even he says when I'm the good shepherd that he makes a distinction because not everyone is able to lead in the way that he leads. He leads his sheep to green pastures. He leads them to still waters as the psalmist says. But the reality of it is that it's not a matter of Christ leading. It's a matter of me believing that he's leading and following that leading. So if we're going to overcome and deal with this issue of regret, we have to understand, beloved, that Jesus died for our regrets. And that in Christ, there are no regrets. Here's what that means for you, that greater days are ahead of you. Greater days are ahead of you. You see, that's the issue with dealing with regret. Regret blinds our minds and it makes us to, to worry about unnecessary things. And we're so focused on the issue that we don't see what's ahead. Anytime that when we're dealing with the issue of regret, that we begin to focus on ourselves, we will get more stressed. We will start to worry more. But the antidote to worrying is keeping your eyes and focus upon the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we're talking about overcoming regret here, we need to understand that Jesus died, went to the cross for us so that we would not have to deal with regret. Hear me, beloved. Stop paying for something that Christ has already paid the price for. You don't have to carry a weight that Jesus is already carrying. His shoulders are broad enough. And there are times when, when that issue of regret begins to rise up in our thinking or in our thought or when someone brings it up, we have to remind it that this is not a, a weight that I, that I have to carry. Jesus has already carried it for me. Dealing with overcoming regret. Look at 
Look at Isaiah 53, verses 4 and 6. Look what the prophet Isaiah here says. Isaiah chapter 53, from verses 4 to 6. As we're talking about Christ has already paid for something that we don't have to pay for. Look at what the prophetic word that comes forth referencing to Christ, Isaiah chapter 53, verses 4 to 6. The Bible says this, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. God has placed your regrets on Christ. God has placed your guilt, your shame upon Christ. Christ Jesus does not need our help in carrying those things. And ultimately, this is what the prophet is saying here. I want you to look at the person next to you and say, it's time to move on. Jesus has already dealt with my regrets on the cross. In Christ, there are no regrets, so it's time to move on. The second thing that we need to know if we're going to deal with this issue of regret and overcome it is this, that God has restored you and I through the blood of Jesus. God, I want you to say that with me. Say, God has restored me through the blood of Jesus. You see, in the blood of Jesus, there is forgiveness. And what comes out of that forgiveness is your restoration. So when we're looking at the issue of regret, rather than holding on to that weight, rather than allowing it to take us off course, rather than allowing it to make us to seem as though we're depressed, we need to understand that Jesus dealt with our regrets on the cross. And not only has he dealt with it, but through his sacrifice, he has off given us the forgiveness of our sins. And the result of that is our restoration. Even Peter, after he denied Jesus three times, the scripture tells us that Jesus restored Peter. And you'll see that in John chapter 21, verses 15 to 17. And you'll also see that in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 to 41. When we're talking about Jesus restoring Peter in the book of Acts, a restored Peter preached the message of the gospel and the scripture says that God added 3,000 people to the church. In John 21, 15 to 17, we see where Jesus, after he resurrects from the dead, He's talking with Peter and he tells Peter, he says, Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Do you love me? Take care of my lambs. Do you love me? Feed my sheep. This was Jesus restoring Peter. Hear me, beloved. In Christ Jesus, your slate is cleaned. Your destiny does not begin with regret. It begins with restoration. Come on, can you lift your hands to the Lord tonight? Say, Jesus, thank you for wiping my slate. I'm talking to people who have a clean slate in this place. People who no longer deal with the issue of regret. People who no longer look backwards, but they only look forward at what is ahead. Because the blood of Jesus has restored you and it has cleaned your slate. So I don't care what the situation is, what the circumstance is, there is no situation in this room tonight that is bigger and greater than the blood of Jesus. When the blood speaks on your behalf, there is no one who can bring an accusation against you. Because the blood does speak. 
The scripture tells us even Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father, he makes intercession for us. And I believe that every time that the accuser of the brethren goes before the Father and say, but look at this one, they broke your law. Look at this one, Jesus says, but the blood, 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 because the blood, it speaks for you. Can you imagine heaven assigning you a defense lawyer that you don't have to pay for, that you don't have to rent, that a defense lawyer who is going to be on top of your case for the rest of your days. That lawyer will defend you. When you're guilty, he'll speak on your behalf. His prosecuting rate is undefeated. Because no circumstance can argue against the blood. There is no failure in this room that can stand against the blood. Jesus has wiped our slates clean. No more regrets. That is how Peter, even after denying Jesus, is interesting because at the communion table, Jesus says, someone will betray me. But when you follow Luke 22, you will see there were two betrayals that took place. Judas and Peter. One could not deal with the regret of his actions. And the other one, it took Jesus telling Peter, the devil desires to sift you, but I have prayed for you. There are some things, I don't care how strong we think we are, we will never be able to get through it without the grace of God. This is how Peter was able, even after denying Jesus, to still preach the gospel. Even after Jesus resurrected, and he appears to Peter, and he begins to ask him, do you love me? Do you love me? The scripture even says, you can, Peter got a little irritable. He says, Lord, you know I love you. And the reason why that is, because he was still dealing with that regret. He was still carrying it. Lord, you know that I love you. I know I've messed up. And that is how some of us, we feel at times. We feel that way at times. When we've fallen short, when we've missed the mark, all of a sudden our whole Christianity is in question. Because God, I don't feel worthy, but hear me. Understanding the righteousness of Christ, that God has made us righteous in Christ, we don't have to feel that, it's a matter of believing it. The more that you believe, that I am righteous in Christ Jesus, the more that when those issues of regret arise, they, they will no longer have a place in the imagination through your thoughts. The more that I am Christ conscious, the more sin has no effect. The more that I understand what Jesus has done for me by dealing with my issue on the cross, by restoring me now, the more that I begin to walk in liberty and in freedom. So if we're going to understand, if we're going to overcome this issue of, of regret and deal with it, we need to understand that God has restored you through the blood of Jesus. There is forgiveness in the blood. We said that Peter's destiny did not begin with regret. It began with an act of grace. It began with restoration. Jesus restoring Peter after he fell short. We said that in Christ that your slate is clean. The last thing I want to share with you with this, if, if we're going to deal with this issue of regret and overcome it, the last thing that we need to understand is that when the thoughts of our failures and shortcomings and those regrets, when those thoughts try to arise within our mind, we need to understand that God has already given us 
the victory. Here's why. He's given us the victory because for every man, every woman who has put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, God has given you a personal intercessor, a personal advocate who 24-7 is praying for you, praying against those thoughts, praying against those uh, uh, um, desires to live and walk after the flesh. In other words, God has committed himself to your spiritual growth. He's committed himself to seeing you accomplish and fulfill your destiny and at times when those feelings or thoughts of regret begin to arise God has given you a personal intercessor who is praying for you so that when it arises the one who is praying for you inwardly he begins to manifest himself and all of a sudden you start to feel supernatural strength coming to say no I'm not defined by that that isn't me greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world I am an overcomer I I am the head and I'm not the tail. God has given you an intercessor and he speaks on your behalf. How was Peter able to recover from regret? Jesus tells him in Luke 22 verse 31 and 32, Jesus said, Peter, I've prayed for you. You may not see it yet. It hasn't happened yet. But when it does happen, Peter, you're going to survive it. Here's why. Because I have already prayed for you. And Jesus said, whom the Father has given, no one can snatch them from out of his hands. Look at someone and tell them you are safe in the hands of God. Look at someone else and tell them regret has no power over you. You have someone that's praying for you. You see, the Holy Spirit, he prays the perfect prayers according to the will of God. He prays for heaven to meet earth and for earth to meet heaven. He prays for the will of God in all things. As Paul says, who can know the mind of God except the spirit of God? And yet that spirit lives within us. Therefore, enabling us, empowering us to know the mind of God. We have the advantage, beloved, because we have the Holy Ghost that lives within us, who reveals all things to us. Let me tell you something. Regret has a funny way of revealing what is really in us. Peter, who walked with Jesus, when you look at the gospel accounts, every time Jesus would consistently tell his disciples, there's coming a time I'm not going to be with you. I'm going to be betrayed. And in one circumstance, the scripture tells us, Peter even spoke up and said, Lord, don't say that. And Jesus recognized the influence of Satan speaking, trying to deter him from his mission. And he tells Peter, tell Satan, get behind me. At the communion table, when Jesus talks about being betrayed, we see the same situation take place where Peter speaks up, Lord, no, not I. And yet the Bible tells us that when they came to take Jesus, that Peter took the sword and cut off the ear of one of the servants of the high priest. So Peter was willing to fight for Jesus. He was willing to fight for him. Peter loved Jesus. But yet when he was taken... The Bible says that he stayed at a distance. He stayed at a distance. The reality of it, beloved, is that as much as he loved Jesus, as much as he would follow Jesus, when it came down to it, Peter was afraid for everything that Jesus stood for. Because Jesus spent three and a half years teaching his disciples how to deny themselves teaching them how to give up earthly pleasures and desires in order to pursue the kingdom of God. Three and a half years of telling them that they would be hated, they would be persecuted. And when Jesus was now taken, his closest friend, 
was at a distance. He was at a distance. How was he going to recover? In one of the accounts, the Bible says, the third time when he denied him, Jesus looked at him. And I believe that in that moment, Peter, the guilt he felt, the shame that he felt. And the Bible says in, in our main passage in Luke, verse 62, that he cried, but he cried bitterly. This was a deep regret because he knew the teachings of Christ, all the words of Jesus, and here when it counted the most, he was nowhere to be found. You see, there are times when fear, it, it grips. But Jesus says, don't fear any man, but only fear the one who can kill both or destroy both the body and the soul. Only fear God. But we see that his regret revealed the issue that he was dealing with. The issue that three and a half years we have gotten used to the Messiah. The issue that we, they expected Jesus to establish an earthly kingdom. And every time they looked to lift him up and glorify him, he would walk away. Because Jesus came to establish the kingdom in the hearts of man. And here he was again. Everything he had prophesied and predicted, here it was coming to pass. Beloved, the only way that Peter could have recovered for something like this, it was because Jesus had already interceded on his behalf. Don't underestimate the power of prayer. Don't underestimate it. The power of prayer. Don't underestimate the Holy Spirit that prays for you and that lives within you. There are some things you don't even have to open your mouth about, but you receive them because the inward witness, the Holy Ghost, has already prayed about it on your behalf. Don't underestimate it. Because prayer may be the difference between your ability to recover so don't underestimate it. Jesus often gave himself to it. When you look at the Lord's Prayer, we don't see a, a pattern that's meant to be repeated by words. What we see is an understanding of someone who has come to full dependency upon God. God as being Abba, Abba meaning source. Who art in heaven, holy is your name. His attributes. And we see giving, God give us this day our daily bread. Bread Hebraically is food. Food gives life to the body. So Lord give me today the daily life that I need. We see a constant dependency upon him. A constant coming to the end of ourselves and saying, God, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I don't want to do it by myself. I'm relying upon you. Give me the daily life that I need. Forgive me of my trespasses. I'm once again coming to the dependency on him for the forgiveness of sins. And so the Lord's Prayer, we see an understanding of a dependency upon God when we come to him. And that understanding may be the difference between whether we are able to recover when the thoughts of regret arise or whether we may find ourselves engulfed within those regrets. So I just want to leave you with that, beloved. That in Christ Jesus, when we're talking about the issue of regrets, a remorse, shame and guilt. In Christ Jesus, God has sent Jesus to die for your shame, your guilt, your regrets, your shortcomings, your inadequacies. Jesus has already dealt with that on the cross. If we're gonna overcome regret, we have to understand 
that our destiny does not begin with what we have done or the mistakes that we have made. Our destiny begins with God restoring us through Christ Jesus, an act of grace. And lastly, when those thoughts of regret try to arise within us, we need to remind ourselves that God has given us a defense lawyer. 1 John 2, verse 1 and 2, John talks about that. My little children, you have an advocate with the Father, a defense lawyer who speaks on your behalf. And he's given you a personal intercessor who is praying for you, covering you, keeping you, working in you, working through you, working for you. So I just want to encourage you tonight, beloved, no matter what the situation is that you may find yourself in, whether you say, I've made a bad decision, whether you say that, uh, um, that there are certain things that, that you wish you could do over, no matter what the situation is, there is no situation that is too great for the Lord Jesus Christ to restore us from, to deliver us from, to pray us through. Give it to Jesus. Can you stand to your feet tonight? I want you to just lift your hands to heaven tonight and just talk to the Lord tonight. You know where you are, beloved. Whether maybe you've been carrying some form of regret. Maybe, maybe you've been looking backwards instead of looking forward. Maybe you've been focusing too much on your failures rather than what God's goodness and what he has done for you. If you find yourself in that place where you're wrestling with thoughts of, I wish this and it, it, it could have and it should have happened this way. No matter where you are tonight, the blood of Jesus is able to cleanse you. The blood of Jesus is able to restore you. The Holy Ghost is praying for you. He is praying in you. He will pray the perfect prayers through you to combat those thoughts. To bring those thoughts into submission. Father, we just thank you tonight, Lord. Lord, I just pray for my brothers and sisters here tonight, Lord, who may have wrestled with regret, even like Peter did, Lord, who may be looking at their situation and feel hopeless, who may find themselves in a place of shame or guilt because of bad decisions. But Lord, I just speak restoration in this place tonight. I speak the freedom of the Lord in this place tonight to set them free tonight, Lord. Holy Ghost, I pray that your presence, that you make your presence known more than ever, Lord. I pray that even when the thoughts of, of depression arise, when the thoughts of guilt and shame arise, that more thoughts of righteousness will arise, Lord. Father, I pray, Lord, that my brothers and sisters in this place tonight will be more Christ conscious, be more righteousness conscious, Lord. And to truly understand what you have done. That like Peter, many of us, Lord, who were sinners, Lord, but yet because of your blood, because of your grace, Lord, you delivered us. You healed us, Lord. You restored us, Lord. That our destiny, God, that you've established, Lord. I pray tonight for hope to arise in the hearts of your people, Lord. I pray for every thought of doubt, every thought of guilt, every thought of shame, that hope will arise, that righteousness will arise, Lord, that peace will arise, Lord. I just pray the strength of God over you tonight. Come on, keep your hands lifted. Just tell the Lord, I receive tonight, Lord. I receive. I pray in this season, may the Lord move you forward. I pray in this season, may the Lord prevent you from looking back. I pray in this season that every voice of regret be silenced in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And that the voice of hope will arise in you. That the voice of truth will arise in you. That the voice of righteousness shall arise in you. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We give you praise, Lord. 
we thank you Jesus we thank you Lord come on let's just sing this song to the way it used to be before your presence came and changed me come on just declare tonight that I won't go back I can't go back it's to the way it used to be before your presence came and changed me come on if you believe that just lift that up tonight yes I won't go back can't go back can't go to the way the way it used to be before your presence came and changed me I won't go back I won't go can't go back to the way it used to be before your presence came come on can we declare one more time I won't go back I won't go back I can't go back to the way it used to be before your presence came and I won't go back I won't go back I'm moving forward I'm moving forward to the way it used to be before your presence came and come on let me bless you can you lift your hands beloved the Lord bless you the Lord keep you the Lord cause his face to shine upon you may the Lord be gracious to you may the Lord's countenance always be turned towards you may the Lord prosper you and may the Lord give you peace if you believe that in Jesus mighty name can you shout a hallelujah can't go back I won't go back to the way before your Gresham, go ahead one more time. Come on, let's. I'm delivered. I'm set free. I'm set free. I won't go back. Won't go. I'm delivered. I'm healed. Way in you. Thank you, Jesus. Your presence came in. Oh, you changed me, so I won't go back.